Welcome. I'm Dr. Jadine Clayton, the Director of the Office of Research on Women's Health here at the National Institutes of Health and the NIH Associate Director for Research on Women's Health. I'll introduce you today to the concept of inclusion in clinical research and the importance of diverse representation in clinical studies. This is a first of a four-part series on inclusion in clinical research that provides an overview of the importance of inclusion in research, data on participants in clinical trials, policies, and how to address inclusion in grant applications and contracts. The goals for this session are to learn about inclusion and the importance of inclusion in clinical research, recognize barriers and facilitating factors in recruiting a diverse population for clinical studies, and understand why sex and gender matter in biomedical research. Inclusion ensures that the distribution of study participants by sex, gender, race, ethnicity, and age reflect the populations needed to accomplish the scientific goals of a clinical study. Federal law and NIH inclusion guidelines uh, on clinical research were adopted to increase the representation of women, underrepresented minorities, and children in clinical research and in order to address potential harms, real or perceived, created by their exclusion or their omission. Federal law and the 1993 NIH Revitalization Act require that human subject research must address the inclusion of women and minorities in clinical research studies as appropriate for the scientific goals of the study. In March 1998, NIH released a policy and guidelines on the inclusion of children as participants. In response to 21st, the 21st Century Cures Act that was issued in 2016, NIH inclusion across the lifespan policy superseded the, the policy on inclusion of children. It now requires that individuals of all ages be included, such as those younger than 18 and those over the age of 65, when conducting clinical research, unless there is a strong justification for their exclusion. So why is inclusion important? Certain populations may be more at risk for certain diseases, such as diabetes and heart disease. And it's, so it's important for patients in those populations who are more likely to be treated for a condition to be included in a trial that's studying that disease. It allows for a full picture of the risk and benefit of treatments that are being tested in clinical studies because there are important differences in how do people of diverse groups respond to a treatment. Information on those differences can then be included in potentially a product labeling, but importantly to help doctors and patients make informed evidence-based treatment decisions. By using one demographic group and generalizing findings across all populations, differences between various groups are not accounted for. When representation of demographic groups, clinical outcomes, due to biological, cultural, social, or economic differences can be reported and addressed. This ensures equitable distribution of risks and benefits of participation in clinical research, and researchers uh, are in a position to study diseases and test treatments on the groups of individuals who are affected by those disease and diseases and who will receive those treatments, helping to ensure safe and effective treatment for everyone. This is why diversity in clinical research and clinical trials is essential. Though this list is not exhaustive, there are several benefits from inclusion to the clinical and scientific community, such as gaining advances in knowledge from research, for example, un uncovering disease states that differ in prevalence, diagnosis, severity, and outcomes between men and women, incorporating that knowledge into training and education, implementing new concepts into practice that can directly affect patient outcomes, changing standards of practice and in public health so that it'll be more effective, providing access to sex and gender, race, ethnicity, and culturally appropriate, as well as age-appropriate health care, and then diversifying the workforce so that in the future, future studies can be designed to recruit participants from diverse backgrounds and implement those findings for everyone. All of these steps can increase trust and aid in enrollment and retention of participants in clinical trials. 
These benefits serve as a positive feedback loop to allow for more discoveries relevant to everyone. Having a well-represented population in clinical studies allows for researchers to investigate those treatments and study the outcomes for everyone. This can also support addressing health disparities and promote health equity. Recruitment is key to getting participants involved in clinical studies. Though there may be interest in participating in clinical research, there may be barriers that limit enrollment and study compliance. Potential barriers that impact the involvement of racial and ethnic minorities in clinical research, as well as women, have been identified for both researchers and participants. Some researcher barriers include lack of knowledge or understanding about cultural differences among racial and ethnic minorities that can result in ineffective communication strategies, and that can affect both recruitment, enrollment, as well as retention. Another barrier is incorrect assumptions about the effectiveness when uh, transferring information from one group to another. The inappropriate use of re recruitment strategies among racial and ethnic minority groups that were developed for white participants, and then lack of knowledge about how to adapt recruitment materials culturally and linguistically. Failure to facilitate culturally sensitive and meaningful discussions and informed consent to ensure if truly informed choices in the enrollment process is another example of a barrier. On the participant side, mistrust, fear, or a lack of confidence in the research enterprise can contribute as a barrier. Logistical concerns, including need for childcare, scheduling conflicts, conflicts, lack of transportation, are also barriers. Appropriate support to research-related factors, such as lengthy consent documents and lack of adequate information about clinical research can serve as obstacles as well. Overt and subtle forms of racism and discrimination operating at multiple levels can play a role in addition. Historical mistreatment in medical research, in, such as the Tuskegee syphilis study that started in 1952 and lasted, 1932, excuse me, and lasted for 40 years is another important context to consider. The legal status of an individual and the stigma associated with the clinical condition that they are experiencing may provide uh, barriers to enrollment. So how can researchers increase or enhance the diversity of participants in clinical trials? They may need to employ efforts that address culturally and linguistically correct uh, recruitment strategies to facilitate the engagement of different demographic groups. Such efforts can increase the likelihood of a greater rapport and trust building between study staff and participants and improved adherence to study protocols by the participants. Translation of materials into appropriate languages is important, including families and communities in the dialogue and partnering with community organizations can go a long way, and including investigators and staff from the same communities as participants and retaining those staff and interviewers over time to ensure continuity has been shown to be associated with better outcomes. Strategies for recruitment should be based on both knowing what motivates participants and addressing barriers. One case study example is the Diabetes Prevention Program. The Diabetes Prevention Program is a multi-center randomized control trial designed to test whether diet and exercise or medications can prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes in individuals at risk with impaired glucose tolerance. This study used a variety of recruitment strategies to reach diverse, a very diverse representative sample. It was conducted at 27 clinical centers around the United States. The trial enrolled over 3,000 participants, 55% were white, and 45% were from minority groups at high risk for the disease, including African American, Alaska Native, American Indian, Asian American, Hispanic or Latino, uh, or Pacific Islander. The trial also recruited other groups at high risk for type 2 diabetes, including individuals over the age of 60, women with a history of gestational diabetes, and people with a parent, brother, sister, or child who had type 
to diabetes. This study utilized a variety of recruitment strategies to reach a diverse representative sample for prevention trials. The program looked at recruitment approaches, how they performed, and their cost to find the ones that were most effective. Some of the lessons learned were that methods, uh, it's important to employ methods for ongoing assessment and revision of recruitment strategies as needed. A range of recruitment strategies may be useful. The most effective methods for recruiting potential subjects may vary according to gender, age, and race ethnicity of those individuals. Some recruitment strategies uh, require more or less time on the staff, on the part of staff to randomize a participant. And stepped screening may make it easier to identify and recruit volunteers who understand the requirements of the study. Interestingly, uh, the findings of one of the DPP investigators indicated that attempts to recruit older individuals might need to concentrate on direct mail since these individuals may be less likely to participate in screenings and community events or to see posters or newsletters or to see emails. Now that we've covered facilitators and barriers to recruitment for a range of demographics, these next slides will focus specifically on sex and gender in health and disease and in biomedical research. Inclusion of women is critical because of sex and gender differences found in certain diseases. And so they're crucial variables to consider when conducting research. Though the terms sex and gender are often used interchangeably, they are defined as follows. Sex is the classification of living things as male or female according to their reproductive organs and functions assigned by chromosomal complement according to the Institute of Medicine report published in 2001. Every cell has a sex. It's either XX or XY. Sex begins in utero. Sex affects health and disease from risk to treatment response. Gender, in contrast, is a multidimensional psychosocial construct that integrates roles, behaviors, expressions, and identities of girls, women, boys, men, and gender diverse people. It influences how people perceive themselves and interact with others. It begins after birth, affects behavior and perception and health. And in the United States, there is no agreed upon definition of gender. It is important to understand the underlying variables contributing to differences between health conditions seen in women and men. Slide 11 highlights sex as a biological variable and studying sex across the biomedical research continuum. There's still a paucity of data related to female cells and animals at earlier research stages, basic research and preclinical research, and over-reliance on male animal models and cells may obscure findings of key sex differences in health processes and outcomes. So as science has progressed, we have learned less about female biology than we have about male biology. As a result, NIH issued guidance on sex as a biological variable, and this policy was formulated as a guiding principle for uh, the biomedical research continuum. Essentially, studying both sexes across the biomedical research continuum is a good practice for everyone. Consideration of sex may be critical to the interpretation, validation, and generalizability of research findings, and less attention being paid to females has resulted in a mismatch in our understanding about male and female biology. The NIH SABV policy, in a nutshell, states that NIH expects that researchers will factor sex as a biological variable into their research designs, analyses, and reporting for vertebrate animal and human studies. That policy went to effect in January of 2016. NIH expects researchers to study both sexes and to provide a strong justification for studying just one. For example, if a researcher is studying a disease or condi condition that only affects women, like ovarian cancer, this would be a strong justification to exclude males. And if an investigator is studying prostate cancer, which only affects men, that would be a strong justification to exclude females. Research protocols that exclude either females or males will be evaluated by other scientific experts through the NIH peer review process in the context of what is known, available methodologies, and other relevant considerations when accounting for sex as a biological variable. 
there is no one-size-fits-all approach to addressing this policy. Adequate considerations of both sexes in experiments and disaggregation of data by sex allow for sex-based comparisons and may inform clinical interventions. This case study example, the Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation Study, or WISE, is a prospective study uh, involving a cohort of over 900 clinically stable women referred for coronary angiography to evaluate ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease is the leading cause of death among women and presents a treatment challenge due to a lack of evidence-based management. The aim of the study was to improve diagnostic testing for ischemic heart disease and to explore female-specific pathophysiology. There are known sex differences in ischemic heart disease presentation and pathophysiology. For example, microvascular involvement, involvement of the small blood vessels in a heart are, is more common in women than in men and is not detectable by conventional angiography, highlighting the need for different methods to diagnose cardiac ischemia in women. In a 10-year follow-up of the WISE study, 20% of deaths with an all-cause mortality rate and 115 cardiac deaths for a 12% mortality rate were reported for the women who had clinically stable um, but detectable ischemia. And that's why this is important for studies like this to be performed that look for sex-specific patterns, sex-specific diagnostic testing, and sex-specific treatment uh, interventions, treatment and interventions, excuse me. The Contemporary Heart Failure Clinical Trials uh, is another case study uh, that we'll be providing here as an example. This paper was published in JAMA Cardiology, and the objective of this, of this study was to look at enrollment patterns by age, sex, and race ethnicity, and to compare the enrollment in the studies to the demographic make makeup of the U.S based on epidemiologic studies of specific heart failure types. In this study, women were underrepresented in cumulative heart failure clinical trials at the rate of 27% when compared to their representation in the general population of individuals with heart failure, which was approximately 50%. This study also found that the enrollment of women was significantly associated with the mean age of participants in heart failure trials. Exclusion of older participants may be due to strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. Older participants may have comorbidities that make them ineligible for trials, but it's important to address these limitations to enrollment to ensure appropriate representation of all age groups. For more information on inclusion, the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health has created the Outreach Inclusion Toolkit to help principal investigators and their teams fulfill their responsibilities related to inclusion of women in clinical research supported by NIH. We provide information on best practices, federal laws, regulations, and NIH policies, as well as a variety of case studies featuring researchers' actual experiences with including women in their studies. They share lessons learned. The purpose of clinical research is to understand how the human body works and to apply that knowledge to improve health outcomes for everyone. For clinical research to be truly useful, it must reflect the populations that are affected by the diseases and that it intends to help. Given important biological differences by age and sex and other differences by race and ethnicity, it's important to integrate inclusion as a guiding principle for productive science with the aim advancing, of advancing health. Integration of sex and gender, race, ethnicity, and age in clinical research is essential to productive, generalizable, and reproducible scientific inquiry. Studies have shown that varied approaches are needed to recruit diverse populations. It is imperative for clinical trial participants to represent the full spectrum of individuals affected by diseases to provide them best, most accurate, and most complete information possible. Ensuring appropriate enrollment in clinical research promotes health equity. So here's some questions to test your knowledge. 
Which of these are potential barriers for recruitment and retention of women and minorities in clinical trials? Is it A, fear and distrust of the research enterprise, lack of transportation, C, interference with work and our family responsibilities, or D, all of the above? The answer is D. All of these factors contribute as barriers to recruitment of women and minorities in clinical trials. Which of these are not facilitators to recruitment and retention of women in clinical trials? A, cultural and linguistic adaptation of recruitment strategies. B, translation of materials into appropriate languages. C, lack of culturally and linguistically competent research staff. D, including families and communities in a dialogue. And E, partnering with community organizations. The answer is C, culturally and linguistically competent staff can facilitate participation in clinical trials by serving as a resource and holding meaningful discussions about informed consent and other issues to ensure truly informed choices. We hope that this session helps you to understand why inclusion is so important. Including women, minorities, and individuals of all ages is crucial to the integrity of clinical research. The purpose of research is to inform and improve the health of everyone. Turning, to dis turning discovery into health is a crucial mission for all of us in the biomedical research enterprise, and inclusion is a critical component of that. Thank you.